Okay, it's main mem memory management too. You're looking forward to it, right? Hopefully today should be a short lecture. Although we have a lot to cover. I think there's a nice break somewhere in the middle. Okay, but before we start, you saw my email probably. I changed the due dates for these assignments since we were late in posting the lectures and the assignments. Uh, hopefully you've already done the assignments anyway. This is due tomorrow, although we've already, we will have already covered both of these today. And by the time you do these, we will have covered these papers also. So this is for your own benefit, hopefully. Hopefully it's, a, it's an exciting area, and hopefully while reading the papers, you'll get excited about it too. And there's a lot more to be done in this area. That's uh, like how to handle memory interference uh, in many core systems. Okay, any questions on the readings? You guys have already done it, huh? <laughs> okay, uh, this is a reminder again. If you haven't sent uh, your literature survey papers, you're late. Because this was due Sunday, November 11th, right? And don't be late. There are no late assignments accepted. But of course, we're not that strict. But we're accept expecting these uh, papers. And I think there are a couple of groups that haven't sent me uh, the lists. And they should. OK. I think you've seen this. This is the third time you're seeing it. So hopefully, you won't be late the third time you're seeing it. <laughs> Although you're already late. But I don't know how to fix that problem. <laughs> OK. Last lecture, we've started shared resource management, although we had started earlier. Uh, but we started it more formally. Uh, you had seen caches as a shared resource earlier, right? Uh, with utility-based cache partitioning, for example. We may get back to that at some point uh, if you have enough lectures left. But we mainly focused on main memory as a shared resource. Uh, arguably, this is a harder to handle shared resource because you don't have enough pins going off chip. Uh, and even if you consider other technologies like 3D stacked DRAM, which you, some of you may be familiar with, again, there's still a shared resource there because you cannot put, uh, you cannot scale the number of pins as fast as you can scale the number of cores. That's, that seems to be a fundamental problem that we have today. Okay, and we've hopefully, well, I, I guess I'll cover some of these very, very quickly so that we can get up to speed uh, for today's schedulers. I think I'll just sit over here. Um, okay, today we'll end quality of service aware memory request scheduling. So just to give you an idea, how do you handle, how do you design a quality of service aware memory system? Basically, you could design the resources to be smart, uh, smart cache, smart interconnect, smart uh, memory scheduler, and ensure that um, each resource has an interference control mechanism, right? And the other approach is dumb resources, which I will start uh, today. Uh, basically keep each resource free for all, but control the injection into the system such that you have a better overall fair system. And these are not necessarily uh, not combinable, right? You could, eventually you would like to do something like this. And you have seen some of this with source throttling, right? When we talked about interconnection networks, you could throttle the sources that are injecting into the network to get an overall higher performance and more fair system. You could do the same thing for the entire uh, chip, right? You could, you could see uh, your resource boundary. These could be the agents. You could think of this as your shared resources. What the dumb resource approach does is you have this periphery and you have agents injecting requests into these shared resources and you somehow figure out what's happening here and you have some distributed or centralized control that says agent you're injecting too much reduce your injection rate so that I can have a better overall system performance or better overall targets right that's the idea with source throttling basically you don't have too much intelligence here but you have uh, the ability to say, stop injecting for a while, 
or maybe inject at a smaller rate. Right? That's the source throttling, and which is very different from designing the three sources to be uh, like what we've been talking about, right? Uh, Atlas, for example, you don't need to necessarily do that if you have this. But it turns out the best approaches are usually a combination of those two. You would like both. And you will see that. So we were, we've been discussing memory controllers, right? So what have we been discussing, just to give you the context, this is a review slide again. You have this memory controller getting requests from the cores, and it resolves memory contention by scheduling. Then uh, how do you schedule these requests to provide high system performance, high fairness to applications, and configurable to system software? And we've convinced ourselves that memory control needs to be aware of threats. Otherwise, there is no way of doing this. And these are the schedulers we've covered. So I'll just go over this very quickly just to uh, warm up your caches. We talked about stall time fair memory scheduling. Idea is to estimate and balance the thread slowdowns. And takeaway is this gives you proportional thread, thread progress. Uh, and this is good, especially when the threads are heavy. Where they're all mem equally mem similarly memory intensive. And I'll let you think about that. But there were downsides to it also, right? Hard to implement, hard to figure out what the, how, do, how do you get the slowdowns. And then we moved to parallelism over batch scheduling. And we've seen the problem of parallelism destruction, right? You have requests from a, a core going to different banks. And when another core's requests interfere uh, with those requests in a bank, now the request can be serviced serially instead of in parallel. So we want to preserve that parallelism. And, uh, Basically, we want to design a more regular system. You rank the threads, and each thread gets its rank. Uh, this way, uh, it's more likely that a thread's request will be serviced in parallel in different banks. That's the idea of ranking. Right? And this is, uh, again, a general concept. Whenever you have uh, uh, mm, multiple resources, and whenever your job uh, is limited by uh, the last uh, and whenever you have requests to those multiple resources, and whenever your job is really limited by uh, the last request to be completed by any resource, this ranking helps. Right? You could, like, a, a similar analogy and an analogous problem in a very different system. Let's say you have a bunch of different factories, and you're uh, generating different parts of your car. Right? You cannot assemble the entire car until the last factory produces uh, one, one part, right? It's actually called a distributed order scheduling problem. It's, it's, it's been examined in scheduling theory uh, earlier. But it hasn't been applied to memory controllers. So we, what, you could argue that we, could, we kind of applied that theory to memory controllers in a practical way. Is that problem clear? That's, you have different factories and your part, uh, your entire, you cannot assam assemble the entire product until you get all of the uh, parts from different factories. So you would like to really serve everything in parallel, right? Or maybe uh, some, you, you'll have some slack in some of those cases, but we, let's not go into that. You could do better than this if you think about it in a little bit more uh, detail. Because if you have imbalance of requests to different banks in a memory controller, maybe you have some slack between the requests of the same thread, right? Let's say a thread has 10 uh, requests to one bank and one request to another bank. Maybe you don't need to uh, service that one request uh, very early, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So here the idea was to rank threads in uh, in some, uh, and service them in rank order in different banks. But this led to a problem because if you do this, now the highest ranked thread may be generating lots of requests, right? and maybe hogging the uh, entire system. So you actually batch requests to prevent starvation. So we added batching to prevent starvation. And again, this is a general technique, and we've talked about it. It's also employed in different, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also employed in different uh, places in the world. But if you're interested in the theory of this, I'd, uh, I'd recommend this other paper that we had written. It's a more theoretical paper, but it's called Distributed Order Scheduling. And its application to multi-core memory controllers. Actually, multi-core DRAM controllers. It 
it's in principles of distributed computing, 2008. Okay. Okay, so what is the takeaway? Basically, if you preserve within thread bank parallelism, you can improve performance, and you, if you have request batching, you can improve fairness. And we've seen Atlas in the end, and uh, I will not go into detail, you remember this hopefully. Basically, the idea was to prioritize threads that have attained the least service uh, from the memory scheduler. And if you do this, you can improve performance because essentially you're prioritizing light threads, right? Compute intensive threads are making progress. Uh, and also, you're minimizing, that another, put another way, you're minimizing the memory episodes. That's how we started, really. But you had an idea that you were going to evaluate on how to actually figure out the compute episodes and prioritize those. So maybe you can report next week <laughs> on what that is, right? <laughs> Say it again. Tomorrow is fine. Tomorrow is fine? <laughs> okay, you have results already. <laughs> That's the spirit. I like that. <laughs> Okay, so we've covered this. Today we'll cover, I mean, can never get these things right, thread cluster memory scheduling and stage memory scheduling probably. And you already read this paper, right? Parallel application memory scheduling. Do you remember? What's the required reading? This is, the, where, uh, this is where you determine the limiter threads and prioritize them in the memory scheduler. No? Maybe I assigned it to a different class. It was required reading, right? So you remember that idea. OK, so I will not go into too much detail. And we'll cover uh, the rest later. So one thing to keep in mind, we have not talked about, and I will probably not talk about uh, different kinds of requests. But uh, prefetches are an important, prefetcher is an important source also injecting into these shared resources, right? It's not only the core that's generating requests, but it's also the prefetcher that's generating requests. And so far in the memory scheduling discussion, we have not talked about how do you actually handle the prefetches. We're assuming that everything is a demand. And I'll not talk about this, but this is something you should keep in mind. In real systems, you have prefetches. Then how do you prioritize them versus demands? How do you source, how do you throttle some of the prefetchers if they're not, if they're being too aggressive? So I'll uh, refer you to uh, these papers. Uh, basically, the idea here is how do you design a a memory system that actually takes into account prefetch requests. Certainly, you would like to identify what's accurate and what's inaccurate. That helps in that case. Mm. And ideally, you would like to identify what prefetch is accurate, uh, what, what prefetch is inaccurate, and drop it before you send it, right? But that turns out to be a difficult problem in general uh, because. Then, then you would be building a perfectly accurate prefetcher, right, almost. And that's very hard to do. I mean, you remember from 740, right, there's a, a fundamental uh, trade-off between accuracy and coverage. If you want to improve your accuracy, you'll probably lose on coverage because you're being conservative. But if you lose on coverage, then you're probably not improving performance significantly also because you're covering only a fraction, a smaller fraction of your cache misses. So in the... Uh, in the presence of uh, not accurate prefetchers that are potentially aggressive, how do you do the resource management? How do you prioritize prefetches over demands? So one idea, uh, which is this paper, Micro 2008, is to predict the accuracy of prefetch requests. And if prefetches are as accurate, uh, prefetches are deemed to be accurate, then treat them just like demands. If the prefetches are uh, uh, deemed to be not accurate, then treat them uh, as lower priority than demands. Because it's likely that you're not going to get benefit from those prefetches. But that may not be true. So it turns out that uh, doing such an uh, adaptive prioritization policy is better than always treating demands higher prior as higher priority than prefetches. Or treating demands and prefetches are equally all the time. Can anybody guess why? Why do you not want to always treat demands as higher priority than prefetches? Yes? Mispredicted path or things like that. That's right, yeah, mispredicted path is one thing, but let's assume that everything is on the correct path. 
even then you probably would don't want to treat uh, demand requests as uh, this uh, higher well, demand requests as always higher priority than prefetches. Because then there is possible the prefetch will not get back in time, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that could be one reason, exactly. Or you, could, you could be delaying your prefetches for a long time, and you could lose timeliness in your prefetch. There's another reason. Yes? Can I have the same, same as that? Yeah, that's, that's goes to timeliness, probably. Think about the DRAM bank. There's something called the robot for the DRAM bank. If the, if the prefetch is sitting in the row buffer, then it's relatively fast to service it anyway. Now, if you prioritize a demand over a prefetch, you would be closing the row buffer and reopening it again. And if you have a stream prefetcher, it's nice because it just goes through the row buffer and prefetches, very likely prefetches things that already hit in the row buffer. If you're prioritizing demand requests or prefetch requests, uh, then it may be that you could be getting a lot of row buffer conflicts. And that's true. That's what we've observed in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the DRAM system. So doing this adaptive prefetching is better than doing rigid prioritization between prefetches and demands. So sometimes you would actually like to prioritize prefetches over demands <laughs> because you have this row buffer and you could serve that prefetch much faster. Uh, and if you if you do not do that, then you would lose a lot of memory bandwidth because you're going to service that prefetch anyway at some point. Okay? So this is actually a very interesting topic also. And you could, you could potentially think of other requests going into uh, the memory controller. We would consider prefetches, but there are also other requests like I.O. requests, right? You could think of requests from other sources and how should they be treated together. That's an unsolved problem. Okay. OK, this is just to remind you of Atlas. Uh, we've talked about Atlas. Basically, the basic idea is to uh, determine the threads attain service and rank the threads based on that attain service, having threads uh, uh, that have the least attain service ranked highest. And that enables uh, minimization of the memory episode times across the system. And we ranking still any preserves bank level parallelism and robot for locality and bank level parallelism are always at odds. And you should probably think about that uh, more. Um, you can read the paper. I didn't assign this paper, but I'd still encourage you to read the paper. And we talked about how to scale attain service last lecture. So this is relatively low complexity. The downside is now you have lowest ranked threads get delayed significantly. So this is not good for fairness because threads that have attained a lot of service now get delayed significantly. Uh, and that may not be the thing you want to do, especially having a full ranking across. If, what if you have lots of threads that are very high intensity that request a lot from memory? Now you're ranking uh, a very heavy thread, heavy meaning lots of memory requests per second, if you will. Uh, over another, a little bit heavier thread. Right. And that may not be what you want to do because that way you'd always be prioritizing this very heavy thread and your system performance goes down because this, all of the cores are generating a lot of requests and you would be prioritizing only one core. So we're back to the same uh, problem. Your system utilization goes down. Right. So how do we get rid of that problem? Uh, I guess thread cluster memory scheduling gets rid of that problem. Uh, what is the motivation? Uh, and this is a paper that you're reading, so I'm not going to cover it in detail. Uh, but uh, what we, uh, this is uh, my PhD student, Yungu Kim's work. What we had done was taken uh, a bunch of these schedulers and we wanted to look at how, how they do in terms of system throughput and fairness. This is the weighted speed up in terms of system throughput on a 24 core, four memory controller system with a bunch of uh, workloads, multi-program workloads. And the y-axis is the maximum slowdown. That's a measure of fairness. The lower, the better. You minimize the maximum slowdown max uh, of any thread in the system, the better. Ideally, you would like one, right? But one is an unachievable ideal. Mm. Or you need, you need no interference to get one. <laughs> OK, ideally, you would like to be here. 
better system throughput, and better fairness. If you plot this, Atlas sits here, and you'll see why it's system throughput bias, because ParBS is here. ParBS is more fair, but its system throughput is lower. Stall time fair memory scheduling is uh, not good for any metric compared to uh, these. This is row hit first scheduler. It's not good either in terms of fairness or throughput. And this is first come first serve, basically no scheduling. Right? We, could, we could think of first come first serve as no scheduling because you're not really do, picking anything. Right? You're just servicing as things come. So as you can see, no previous scheduling algorithm that we've discussed so far provides the best fairness and system throughput. So how can we get the ideal? That's, that was the goal in this work. And that's always a good goal in research, right? Whenever you have a plot like this, you should always strive for going that way. <laughs> OK, so if you look at uh, the two approaches, I'll just give you a high level uh, approach of uh, how to maximize throughput and how to maximize fairness. If you would like to maximize throughput, you would like to prioritize less memory intensive threads. Because if a thread is very uh, memory non-intensive, and if you give it higher priority, this can maximize the computation that's done in the system. Now, that's not always true again, right? Because of, the because of the example that I just gave you. What if a lot of threads are very, very heavy? And if you prioritize one heavy thread over another, now you lose system throughput because your core utilization goes down. So this, uh, think about under what conditions this, what I said is really true. This is really true when you have a very wide variance in terms of the intensity of the threads. But the downside here is uh, thread C stars. Uh, because if there are lots of threads in front of it, it's not going to get its turn uh, for, a, for a while. Right? If you take the fairness bias approach, basically you would like to take turns accessing memory. This gives each thread a chance. Right? The upside of this is this thread doesn't starve. The downside is now this thread that can make a lot of progress in its core is not prioritized. Now you get reduced throughput. Right? So it turns out you, you cannot, it's, it's very hard to design a single policy that is sufficient for all of the threats. And I think this uh, example demonstrates that. So how do you achieve the best of both worlds? Uh, basically, we would like, we'd like to use the principles. For throughput, maximizing throughput, we would really like to prioritize these memory non-intensive threats. Think of these threads as memory non-intensive. Uh, for fairness, it turns out fairness problems are caused by memory intensive threads being prioritized over each other. Like if you have these heavy threads, lots of memory intensity, if you prioritize one over the other, then you'll be unfair to the one that be, that's being deprioritized constantly. So you don't want to rank. You don't want to have a strict ranking between these, but you want to shuffle the thread ranking so that each thread gets its chance to be prioritized. That's the idea. This way, again, proportional progress principle, right? You enable proportional progress across these threads. And it turns out memory intensive threads have different vulnerability to interference. So if one of them gets deprioritized for a while, it slows down more versus if some other one gets deprioritized for the same amount of time. And you've seen that before, right? Random versus streaming threads. Random is much more susceptible. Uh, to being deprioritized. So we, you can take into account this vulnerable to interference. So you can shuffle asymmetrically. What does this mean? You get, uh, you get to give some threads to be the higher rank more often than other threads uh, get the same rank. And I'm not going to talk about this, but you can read the paper uh, uh, for more details on this. So that's the basic idea of thread cluster memory scheduling. So how do you do this? Well, there are already two clusters, right? We'd like to group the threads into two clusters, uh, intensive and non-intensive. And we'd like to prioritize the threads that are memory non-intensive, because they can make very fast progress. Right? And if you prioritize this cluster over the intensive cluster, you don't cause significant fairness problems, because these threads have, few, by definition, few requests anyway. They, they don't generate requests all the time. They generate requests once in a while. And if they, those requests get prioritized, hopefully they're not going to cause too much problem to this in intensive cluster. Now, hopefully, that should point you to the importance of 
grouping these threads, right? If you, if you make a mistake and if you put one of the big ones here, then that assumption is not true anymore. Okay, so within each cluster, uh, thread cluster memory scheduling employs different policies. Within the throughput oriented cluster, these are the compute intensive threads. Uh, threads that have, that are more compute intensive are prioritized over others because they can make faster progress. And within the memory intensive cluster, we shuffle the thread ranks such that everybody gets a chance for fairness purposes. That's the idea. And it turns out doing this actually improves performance also. If you look at, uh, for, for the reason I said, you get better core utilization if you do this. Okay, so how do you cluster the threads? Basically, uh, the memory controller sorts each, uh, sorts threads based on the last level cache misses per kilo instruction. And you get this. And it computes a total memory bandwidth usage. And it forms a cluster based on uh, the total memory bandwidth usage. Uh, all those threads that constitute alpha t of the total memory bandwidth usage are grouped as non-intensive non cluster. And how do you determine alpha? Well, that's, that's more empirical, right? So cluster threshold uh, in the experiments that I'll show is less than 10%. Okay. And that's actually in the Achilles heel of this mechanism also. How do you determine that alpha? Because if you, don't, if you do not do a good job, you, do, you run into robustness issues. And hopefully that will become more clear later. So how does this operate? Basically, it's a quantum-based mechanism. During a quantum, uh, the memory controller monitors thread behavior, memory intensity, bank level parallelism, and robo for locality. I will not talk about why these are needed, but once you read the paper, it will become clear. At the beginning of the quantum, it performs clustering and computes niceness. Well, these are needed for niceness of the threads to do this asymmetric shuffling. And within the next quantum, it uses uh, this cluster information as well as uh, cluster information to prioritize threads. And uh, there are smaller shuffle intervals in which the ranking of the threads is shuffled. Okay? And this is the final scheduling algorithm. Basically, requests from higher rank threads are prioritized and the ranks are determined this way, non-intensive cluster is ranked higher than intensive cluster. And within the non-intensive cluster, lower intensity threads are ranked higher, lower memory intensity. And within the intensive cluster, ranks are periodically shuffled, shuffled at fine grain. And this shuffling order can be predetermined, right? At the beginning of the quantum, you say, this is the shuffling order that I will have at each shuffle interval. So there's no overhead in determining that uh, within at a very fine grain. Okay, and um, the rest are similar as you. Uh, so you have row hit requests prioritized over others and older requests are prioritized over others to break ties. Make sense? Okay, so how does this perform? Just to give you basic results, these are the same uh, things that I plotted earlier, but it turns out th thread cluster memory scheduling pushes the frontier here. Uh, it's a heterogeneous scheduling policy Basically, it provides best fairness compared to these different policies and also best system throughput. And it turns out this has another property, this cluster threshold, as you vary that, uh, you can trade off between fairness and throughput. So all of these scheduling algorithms, you, you can think of them as configurable, right? For example, uh, remember stall time fair memory scheduling? We had a parameter that said unfair, if, if unfairness is less than alpha, then employ a throughput-oriented scheduling policy. Otherwise, employ prioritize the max slowdown thread first. Now, if you change that alpha, you can get different points in terms of performance and fairness. And it turns out it's very difficult to predict where you will go based on that alpha. It's not, uh, you, can, you can basically get uh, bound the slowdown, but your performance doesn't improve significantly. With first ready, first come, first serve, this is a row hit first scheduler. Again, you can have another uh, parameter, which we call the cap. Uh, the basic idea is how many uh, row hit requests, how many younger row hit requests can you reorder over the oldest requests in the system? And this is the cap, basically. And if you change that cap, you get a weird curve like this. 
And it's very dependent on the workload also. And it turns out uh, we had this uh, in the stall time fair memory scheduling paper. Uh, so if you read that paper, you will see that. It turns out that similar policies implement in AMD's uh, chipsets in Bar starting from Barcelona. So this is for your information. People actually think about these things. Mm. OK, but this is not good, of course, right? You cannot reason about what's happening to the system. So parallelism over batch scheduling, this is what happens if you vary the batch marking cap. How many requests from a thread for each bank you mark uh, when, when you batch requests. And again, this is not very uh, intuitive. Atlas, I don't know what is varied here. <laughs> I, think, I think what is varied here is really uh, the, mm, the time interval. Because Atlas doesn't have that many parameters, right? <laughs> OK. But if you vary the cluster threshold and thread cluster memory scheduling, at least within reasonable bounds, this is the curve you get. So it's a relatively mm, smooth trade-off between fairness and throughput. Because you're really adding, you're really changing the boundary between throughput and fairness once you do that. OK. So that's the idea. Any questions? Now that you know this, you can improve on this much better, hopefully. <laughs> so what are the upsides of this? Well, obviously, as results also show, it provides high throughput and high, uh, high performance, well, high fairness and high performance at the same time. Uh, there are downsides. Uh, as I've already told you one downside. It's not written here, but this is to motivate the next work. <laughs> one downside is really this uh, sharp cutoff between clusters is actually mm, in, in practice, it's very hard to do. Not hard to do, but if you do the wrong decision, if you cluster a thread uh, to be memory intensive, where it should really be classified as memory non-intensive, or vice versa, uh, this doesn't work very well anymore. So maybe there are other ways of uh, solving the problem. Maybe you have more, f more clusters. Uh, and actually, my thinking is more from the probabilistic direction. If it's better to perhaps probabilistically choose some of these clusters unless you're really sure uh, where a thread belongs. So if you're interested in this area, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in more probabilistic policies. Because this is very rigid, right? It says this is the cutoff. And beyond this, memory intensive, otherwise memory non-intensive. And you always prioritize the memory non-intensive ones over memory intensive ones. And in systems, that if once you do that, it's uh, it's difficult, uh, your, your policy becomes non-robust. Right? Whereas if you're more probabilistic, you say, oh, I don't know about this thread very well, but maybe half of the time I'm going to put it in this cluster and half of the time in that cluster. Then you're uh, less rigid and very likely more robust. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you're interested in that kind of resource management mechanisms, there is a seminal paper uh, by Carl Waltzberger. I don't know if I referenced this before, but it's basically called lottery scheduling. Well, it's a longer title, but I'll leave lottery scheduling here. OSDI 1994, if I remember correctly. Basically does probabilistic resource management. And the idea is they apply this to an operating system scheduler. And operating system scheduler probabilistically assigns shares, times, to different threads, such that every thread gets its chance. OK. OK, there are other downsides here. Uh, scalability lar to large buffer sizes and effectiveness in a heterogeneous system. Uh, once you read the stage memory scheduling paper, this will become more clear. Uh, but we can, we can go into that later. I'll let you read the paper so you can decide for yourself. Any questions? OK. I'll cover stage memory scheduling also. So uh, you know that systems are already becoming heterogeneous, right? Uh, we don't, we don't ha only have CPUs, but we also have other agents in the system. In fact, arguably, we already had those agents, right? You have I.O. requests going into uh, the memory controller. But now you have very other intensive uh, accelerators also uh, sharing the memory controller with uh, cores. And one, one of them is a GPU. 
It turns out GPU is very intensive. I, I don't think I have the slides here, but uh, GPU applications, at least uh, the ones that exercise the GPU, tend to be uh, very memory intensive, much more memory intensive than your regular CPU application. And also, they use the bank level parallelism that is present in memory. So once you have that, you really have a memory hog. <laughs> it's really hogging your entire memory system. And you may have other uh, applications in your course, CPU course, that are more latency sensitive. Then the question is, how do you actually do the scheduling between CPU and GPU? And the other issue here is because GPU requires, uh, generates a lot of requests, how do you actually design a scheduler that's scalable in terms of the buffer sizes? So I'll just give you key ideas uh, today. I'll not go into too much detail. I'll defer you to the paper, or maybe we'll go into more detail uh, on Wednesday. But the observation is that uh, heterogeneous CPU GPU systems require memory scheduler with large request buffers, because GPU basically floods the memory system. If you want to take thread cluster memory scheduling and apply it to uh, a system like this, uh, it becomes hard to scale. Even the, even the row hit first schedulers are hard to scale in a CPU GPU system, right? Because let's say you have, uh, you would like to buffer these requests. You have a thousand entry request buffer. You somehow need to figure out what are row hits and what are row misses, right? How do you do that? Well, you, can, you can think about that a little bit. Uh, I think there are some ways of doing that, but uh, it, it, it does increase your complexity. It's a lot easier to figure out in a 64 entry scheduling buffer what is the row hit and what is the row miss, right? Because you do the search in a smaller window. And on top of that, if you want to add application awareness, then you still, uh, uh, you need to do more operations on your request queue. So it's hard to scale uh, these monolithic scheduler designs to large request buffer sizes. The solution that uh, Rachada and a couple of my other students developed was stage memory scheduling. Basic idea is instead of building a monolithic buffer, why don't you decouple some of the tasks and stage them? So the, the key high level idea is intuitive, right? And uh, I guess I'll go into a little bit more detail. The first stage is you have these sources uh, that inject into FIFO queues that form batches of row hitting requests. You basically form batches to uh, maintain robo for locality in the queues. In the next stage, there's a batch scheduler. This is a different batch from parallelism over batch scheduling. This is a, a batch is a sequence of requests that go to the same row. Now what you can do is you can treat that as a scheduling unit instead of a single request. Right. Let's say you have five requests that go to row five, and you can treat that as your scheduling unit going downstream. This way you don't need to allocate a buffer for each request that saves you one thing. And this way you can also preserve robo for locality, right? Because you have this batch moving along. You don't break the robo for locality. And the, the job of the batch scheduler is you have these batches coming from different sources. Which one do you pick? Now here batches can be coming from different cores and the GPU and maybe some other accelerator, right? So how do you pick? Now, we, now you run into all of those fairness and performance issues that we were discussing earlier, right? Because which patch, batch you prioritize uh, has an effect on uh, every course performance. And we're going to use similar principles. Basically, we would like to uh, achieve a balance between fairness and performance, again. Again, for, for performance, what do you, which batch do you want to prioritize? You want to prioritize the batches that are coming from memory non-intensive cores, right? But you also want to preserve fairness somehow. So how do you do that? Well, sometimes you would like to pick from these uh, queues uh, the batches in a round robin fashion. Right. So doing round robin picking from the queues gives you fairness. Prioritizing the shortest threads or non-intensive threads first gives you performance. Now how do you combine them together in a scheduler? And if you read the paper, you'll see that this is a probabilistic policy. With some probability, you pick uh, the shortest job first policy or memory non-intensive thread first policy. With some probability, you pick based on round robin. Make sense? Okay. 
And the third stage, now, now that now uh, the, the scheduler picks uh, the batch, the third stage is uh, what do you do with that batch, right? Now, once you pick a batch, by definition, those batches, batch, that batch goes to the same uh, bank, assuming your memory mapping policy facilitates that, of course. There are some assumptions here. Uh, memory interleaving pol uh, policy facilitates that. Right. You basically send that batch uh, into that command scheduler, and now that command scheduler can be a FIFO. Right? You don't need to search that. So what, what this has done is you've formed batches of requests that hit in the same row, so hopefully you preserved robo for locality. The second stage, batch scheduler, uh, enables you to enforce performance or improve performance and as well as fairness, because it's application aware. And the third part is very simple now. Your DRM command schedule is just a five for queue. And it turns out this is significantly simpler and more scalable than uh, other schedulers and provides higher performance and fairness in a heterogeneous system. So just to give you, oh, I guess I've already given you most of that. But basic idea is decoupling the functional task of the memory controller by partitioning those tasks across several simpler structures. Yes? On graphics yeah. claim to have some dedicated RAM. So uh, are the requests routed through the same memory controller, or do they have a separate memory controller as well? So this is for a system where G GPU and CPU share the same memory. If you have a separate dedicated RAM and they don't share it, then this doesn't apply. You still want to do some scheduling in that memory controller, but the problem is easier in that case, because you're running a single uh, GPU application. So this is for a system like Sandy Bridge, for example. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, where there's, uh, you have CPU and GPU on the same chip, and you're sharing memory controller. OK. Yes? No? OK. <laughs> yeah, I've already given you this idea. Basically, there are three tasks of a memory scheduler. One is maximizing robot for hits. And you do that via batch formation. Group the request to the same row into batches. The second, you want to manage contention between applications. You do that via the batch scheduler, which schedules batches from different applications. And the third is satisfy DRM timing constraints. And that, that's done with the DRM command scheduler. So if you look at this pictorially, this is what it looks like. You want this large request buffer. And a lot of the requests actually come from this purple thing, which is the GPU. Uh, we're going to decouple this into stages. You have these queues where you form the batches. And these queues are per core or per hardware context. You can think of it that way. Now you can think of issues related to this, right? And do, do you have as many queues as the hardware context? Right? That, could become, that could become expensive. Maybe that's the next scalability problem once you do this. Uh, and these, in these queues, batches of requests are formed. The next part is the batch scheduler. And batch scheduler basically conveys the batches downstream. And these are FIFO queues. Oh, I guess I do have a little bit more animation. Basically, batch formation. How are the batches formed? Basically, uh, these, are, these colors uh, code requests that go to the same row. So basically, GPU has large batches because it has lots of requests to the same row, usually. Depends on what application you run on a GPU, but uh, most uh, GPU-friendly applications are written in such a way that you are, you're streaming through a memory. Stage two basically picks from these batches. And let's say, uh, basically it alternates randomly or probabilistically between two policies. One is prioritize the core that has the, f that has the least intensity. We'll call that shortest job first. And if it does that, it basically picks this core. That doesn't have a lot of requests. And in the next cycle, it alternates to another policy, which is round robin, let's call it. Then it picks from these queues in a round robin manner. And you can think of that as the fairness part, right? Let's say it picked core two. Now you have another batch formed in core two. And core four generates more requests. And then it picks core three, because you have round robin policy. And these are just simple FIFO queues. Okay. So if you look at the complexity of this, this I mean, you can imagine that this is much, much simpler than a monolithic scheduler where you need to search for things, right? 
because these are all FIFO cues. And the paper has some results in terms of the complexity. And a reduction comes from you have stages of simpler schedulers. Each stage itself is a simpler scheduler, right? It, because it considers fewer properties at a time, right? You don't consider every property in aggregate. And each stage has simpler buffers. We talked about that. And each stage has a portion of the total buffer size. You don't do all the operations on the big buffer. Okay. I'm not going into detail in terms of uh, the results, but you can read the paper. Uh, this is actually another area that's where it's not clear how you evaluate uh, the results perfectly, because you may be running totally different applications on the CPU and GPU, right? Uh, or you may be running applications that are dependent on each other between the CPU and GPU. Uh, but you can read the paper uh, for details on the results, or maybe we'll go into more detail in the next lecture. Basically, uh, x-axis shows the weight given to the application that's running on the GPU. And we have some metric on the y-axis system performance that somehow considers that weight. Uh, now, assume that this is really reflecting system performance. It turns out the best previous scheduler, when you consider GPU weights that are low, here you're actually thinking about prior to CPU is a lot more important. The applications that are running on the cores are a lot more important here. The application that is running on the GPU is a lot more important here. Its weight is higher. Right? It turns out Atlas is the best scheduler when the GPU weight is relatively low. It makes sense, right? What Atlas does is it really prioritizes non-intensive applications. And as I told you, CPU applications tend to be much more non-intensive than GPU applications. That's why you get the best performance of Atlas. Turns out TCM is good in this area where GPU weight is like that. And this kind of makes sense also, right? Again, TCM, as I told you before, it's good when the applications are relatively heterogeneous and you care about a lot of them. In this case, GPU, it turns out GPU weight here, uh, now you care about pretty much everything in the system because there is no, uh, it's not as biased as I care about only the CPU or only the GPU. And it turns out row hit first scheduler is better here. And why is that? Because if you have very high row buffer locality application that you care about, maybe that's the best thing to do, right? And that's what a GPU application is, at least a typical GPU application is. You have, a, uh, you have very high row buffer locality, and you only care about that application. First of all, then you probably don't want an application aware scheduler if your GPU weight is this high and you just want to prioritize robot for hit requests. Right. And what happens if you uh, use SMS? So SMS provides better performance than the best previous scheduler regardless of the GPU weight. Now it's more effective here, and it's slightly more effective here, because it's very hard to beat a row hit first scheduler over there, right? Because it's doing the best it can. Because you don't really care about the interference from different applications. Make sense? Okay. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, it's actually an interesting area because going forward, uh, systems are becoming much more heterogeneous and you'll have memory controllers as a more contended resource by not only CPU, GPU, I.O. requests, but also all kinds of different accelerators. Now this is already true in uh, some of the cell phone systems, except not at the on-chip level. And that kind of scheduling is an important problem. How do, you, how do you satisfy all of those different agents' requests at high performance, at high fairness, and also uh, providing some guarantees? OK. I think we've already covered this, right? Parallel application. This is the paper you read. Uh, basically, how, uh, how do you do memory scheduling when threads are interdependent on each other? And some of these concepts are applicable, I think, to CPU, GPU systems where you're waiting on, it, uh, waiting on the GPU and the thread, is, the thread that's running on the CPU is dependent on the GPU. But basically, basically, some threads can be on the critical path of execution due to synchronization. Others may not be. And if you have this information communicated to the memory scheduler, you can do a much better job in scheduling. So the idea here, uh, that you've seen is 
somehow estimate the limiter threads that are likely to be on the critical path and prioritize them over other threads that are not likely to be on the critical path. Uh, now once you do that, you're speeding up the critical path, the critical thread that's going to limit your performance. Now what do you do among the other threads? Well, if the other threads are relatively balanced, you would like to shuffle the priorities of those, right? So that you ensure no thread gets left behind so that they don't become the critical path. Right? So that's the idea. So you read this, I think. Oh, this is interesting. This PowerPoint bug is always appearing, right? You see that word over there now, right? <laughs> it's the phantom word, executing. <laughs> there you go. Came back. I wonder what kind of a bug this is. Any guesses? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Those of you who work for Microsoft can tell, maybe. <laughs> OK. OK, I think uh, maybe I'll stop here. Yeah, I think I'll stop here since we've already covered one hour. Uh, next time, we'll pick up with source throttling. And we'll cover uh, some of the other approaches uh, to designing a, a more fair memory system. And if you get a chance to read the paper before that, even though the deadline is later, uh, that would be good. So you can ask more questions. OK. Any questions? All right. I guess see you Wednesday.